just going to leave a few minutes to let everyone come in and make sure that we get everyone before we start the introductions of this ANZ GIN webinar series. We are all very excited. Excellent. Still got some people rolling in. We've had a large number of people register today. Um, and so that's why it's just taking some moments to get everyone in. Sometimes Zoom likes to take its time. But I think the large number of registrations to speak about how important and needed um, this webinar has been. Okay, so it's slowly stopped now. So I want to formally introduce this webinar, the ANZ Guideline International Network webinar series. This is a webinar series that has started uh, late last year. Uh, and this is our second webinar that we're hoping to bring a series of to help improve um, our understanding and, and develop a, a community of guideline developers um, to you know, improve networking and collaboration within our community. Today, I am very, very excited to present Guidelines and Impact, the Art of Storytelling. Uh, I think now more than ever, we need to can look at our impact when we are developing our guidelines and, and how do we measure it and how do we um, ensure that it's being used. So we've got the wonderful Dr. Alex Atkin, and I will introduce a little bit after some housekeeping and Dr. Kaya Evans joining us to be able to talk about their experience. Just a bit of housekeeping before we go forward. You are um, as a, uh, on a webinar function through Zoom. Um, so that means to get the most out of our webinar, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. You've all this joined in on listen only, but you can interact via the chat. I see Zach from JBI, uh, he's on the chat. I'm gonna be on the chat, so I'm willing to, you know, be able to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves. We wanna know where everyone is from today, uh, where, what job you do, what guidelines you've developed, um, be as interactive as possible. We also are going to have quite an extensive Q&A uh, session. We have Stephanie Goodrick joining us in that Q&A session and she is the Assistant Director of Clinical Guidelines from the NHMRC. So we've got someone else to be able to join a panel so please do not hesitate to put in your questions. We will be have a recording available on the ANZ GIN channel, um, sorry the GIN International channel in about two weeks time so if for whatever reason if you'd like to send this on um, we will be able to do that for you or you'll be able to do that in about two weeks time. But first we would like to acknowledge and I acknowledge that many people are coming from different lands today um, but I am in Adelaide so I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We are also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. This is truly a national webinar today so we're very excited for people to recognise which lands they are on today, also within the chat. We also would love some engagement on Twitter. Um, please feel free to hashtag this as ANZ GIN webinar, or if you would like to directly talk to us at ANZ GIN, um, please tweet us at, at gin.anz. 
We have representatives from the NHMRC and from the Autism CRC and Clinic Kids today. So also um, at them and they can also help get in touch with um, maybe Kaya or Alex for you and, and answer any questions that you may think about after the webinar that you have. Or if you're listening in afterwards, um, feel free to tweet us at any time and we'll make sure that we can get a response to you. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Atkin and Dr. Kaya Evans. Alex is the Assistant Director of the NHMRC's Research Policy Section. He is the lead developer of the NHMRC's impact case studies and evaluation related projects. Uh, the, he is also a policy developer in research impact assessment and developer of the CSIRO's impact case studies and impact evaluation guide. We also have joining us Dr. Kaya Evans, and she is a research fellow at Telethon Kids Institute, was the coordinator of Australia's first national guideline for autism diagnosis, and has since been involved in a series of follow-up research projects to implement recommendations from the guideline, along with an evaluation project of the New Zealand Autism Diagnostic Guideline. So I think we've got some of the best speakers for this webinar today. Before we start, we are actually have a poll. Now we are going to put this poll before the chat and then after Kaya, and we're gonna see if there's actually a change. We are measuring the impact of this webinar um, already, practicing what we are preaching. So I'm gonna launch a poll and I would like you to answer, do you collect data that could be relevant to impact? And are you confident in using this data to demonstrate impact? So just quickly have a response. We've got the responses flowing in now. And I just wanna say hello to Simon, to Sally, um, to Amanda, Jessica. Uh, we've got a broad range of people here, uh, Grant. So keep um, introducing yourselves and make sure you do all panelists and attendees so everyone can see what you're writing. If you just direct it to all panellists, only us panellists can see. Excellent. So we've got 78 people. I'll leave it for another 10 seconds to get everyone in. Hello, Shanti. How are you? Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll in about four seconds. So I'm going to end the poll, I'm going to share these results with you. So do you collect data that could be relevant to impact? We have a large proportion, I like to say 75% is, uh, that say yes, you do collect data that's re relevant to impact and that's so fantastic to see. And are you confident in using this data to demonstrate impact? It's a better mixed bag of results um, and I'm hoping that once Alex and Kaya talk to you about um, how they uh, uh, implement this impact and how we can prove impact and show impact um, that that confidence level will go up. So expect another poll after Kaya. Right now I am going to hand over to Dr. Alex Atkins. Alex, can you please put your video on and unmute yourself and share your screen. I'm going to stop sharing. Can you see my yes. screen? Uh, no. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, Alex, can you put your video on as well? Uh, yes. We would love to see your face. Um, sorry, just a second. I'm having a Hi, Alex. Good to see you. We're looking forward to your presentation. All right, great. Um, Can you share your screen again? Yes. Okay, is that on? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Alex. Fantastic. So good morning. My name is Alex Aitken and I lead NHMRC's Impact Case Study Development Team. During this presentation, my goal will be to communicate three of the issues that the team regularly faces when seeking to tell an impact story. These issues are, one, 
that data and information are the essential ingredients of an impact story and they are usually in short supply. Two, an impact story consists of this data and information conveyed as part of a logical narrative. And this narrative will oversimplify the real situation. And three, as a consequence of points one and two, the narrative will not be perfect, but it doesn't need to be, it just needs to be communicated. I mean, the key issue that I'd like to, for you to take home from this presentation is when it comes to impact storytelling, the perfect is the enemy of the good. If it was worth your organization's time to undertake or be involved in a project, then it is probably worth your time telling an impact story about it. Not telling a story because the story cannot be made perfect robs your organization and your audience of the benefits that would come from your work being more widely known. Remember, your audience will not be expecting perfection. If they are reading an impact story about your work, then they just want to learn more about what you've been doing. Turning to the first key issue, data and information are the essential ingredients of an impact story. Ideally, the collection of data and information will have commenced early on during the course of the project that is being evaluated. Commencing data collection early is important because data quality is, a, is often a function of the timeliness of its collection. If issues with data quality are, are identified early on, then they can be remedied early on. When such issues are discovered after a project has commenced or only at its conclusion, then this will often be too late to do anything about them. Commencing evaluation of the data early on is important too, because it helps to reveal both data quality and the types of data that are most useful for telling the pack story, and at a time when it is still possible to organize the collection of new types of data about the project. So, early data collection and evaluation are ideal. However, evaluators often arrive late, that is, evaluating work programs that they themselves did not undertake after the program has commenced or has been terminated and with access to only limited amounts of data that may be of variable quality. When an evaluator finds themselves, uh, finds themselves in this situation, and this is the norm, then they must look to supplement the data they do have with third party data, data sources and to creatively make the best use they can of their own data, including by linking different data sets together. Moving on to the second key issue, Data and information must be conveyed as part of a simple and logical narrative. The readers of your impact story will not thank you for presenting them with a large collection of disparate facts or for trying to communicate the project in all of its complexity. Rather, only the most important details should be part of the narrative and these should include context. Why is the issue so important? Why is it worth their, their time in reading it, reading, reading your story? Activities, what did the project's activities consist of? and outcomes, what were the benefits? Narratives are qualitative, but they should include quantitative elements, that is numbers. Numbers provide confidence that something concrete actually took place because it could be measured, and they also provide some idea of the magnitude of, of the impact. This brings me to the third issue. An impact story will not be perfect, but it does not need to be. It just needs to be communicated. To understand this point, Consider that telling an impact story is like taking your readers on a sightseeing tour through your project and its outcomes. If you have large quantities of high quality data that points to significant impacts, then your job as a tour guide will be easy. This is the impact storytelling equivalent of guiding a tour through a scenic location such as Paris. No matter where your reader looks, they'll see something marvelous. Usually, however, you will have small amounts of lower quality data that points to not especially significant impacts, this is like leading a tour through a rundown industrial precinct. Your challenge here is to keep the attention of your participants on the few interesting features that there are to see. This second situation may be suboptimal, but remember the users of your impact story already understand that they're not touring Paris. They will be expecting that whatever sites you're showing them, these are the best that there are available. These three key issues can be demonstrated in action by considering the development of an NHMRC impact case study. A quick word about the case studies. They've been published since December 2018. There are 16 currently online in both HTML and PDF formats, and they all share a common structure, including a title, a summary, five columns of narrative, a timeline, and biographical information about the profile researchers. The history of tuberculosis control in Australia case study is our most viewed to date. 
And in developing this case study, we encountered each of the three issues that I've described so far. With respect to the first key issue, and just as with all of our other case studies, this case study is replete with data and information that was not originally collected by NHMRC. The majority of the content of this case study was sourced from documents in the public domain, including a PhD thesis, a number of monographs, and statistics provided by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. You might find in your own situations that there are data and information available that you did not originally collect, but that are relevant to telling your story. With respect to the second key issue, as I noted earlier, the case studies are structured in a linear origins to impacts format. Now, in the real world, research impacts do not usually occur in this way, but rather causes have multiple consequences, effects have multiple causes, and they're all linked together in complex feedback loops that defy simple description. The historical events relating, relating to government efforts to control tuberculosis in Australia included many such complexities. Why then? was our history of TB control case study structured in this oversimplified and linear way. Because this makes it easiest for our readers to understand the narrative. From a communications perspective, it is much better for readers to receive a simple message and to achieve a simple understanding than to be presented with a complex message and then to switch off their attention completely and to learn nothing at all. And this is the danger you face when seeking to tell an over complex story. With respect to my third key issue, and further to what I said below, uh, previously, a look at the history of TB control case study will reveal that our case studies do not tell perfect stories. You'll see that this chart demonstrates a precipitous decline in the death rate from TB. Now, in a case study concerned with NHMRC's impact on TB, that looks very promising. However, when you read the story, you'll discover that the Australian tuberculosis campaign, which is the focal part of the story, only commences in 1948. And as you can see, by that time, most of the decline in the TB death rate has already been achieved. So does this mean that the campaign and NHMIC's contributions, uh, contributions to its development were not stories worth telling? Quite the reverse. The story is interesting precisely because of the original scale of the problem and how long it took to resolve. The actions of many people and organizations were necessary to achieve, to, uh, sorry, to address the problem of TB and NHMIC's activities do not need to have been accounted for, sorry, do not need to have accounted for the entire change in order for our contribution to be worth talking about. So don't worry about telling a perfect story. Just worry about telling the best story that you can. And that concludes my presentation and um, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you so much, Alex. We appreciate you talking about your experiences of working um, in the assistant director role and your contributions to ensuring that impact is discussed in regards to guidelines. I'm now going to uh, hand this over to Dr. Kaya Evans. Can you please put on your video uh, and unmute yourself? Um, we would love to be able to hear your experience of working in guidelines um, and your experience of working with the autism diagnosis guideline. Excellent. Um, Danielle, I just need you to allow me to share my video. It's saying I cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. Uh, okay. I am going to make you the host, Kaya, to allow you to do that. Okay, promotion, excellent. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I'll just put my um, slides up there so that you um, can see that as I'm talking about our impact. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, and that's coming up clearly now? It is. And Alex and I are going to stop our video and hand it over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so my name's Dr. Kaya Evans. I'm an occupational therapist by background and um, came into this space um, as a, a recently um, completed postdoc post um, working on the national guideline for autism um, assessment and diagnosis in Australia. So I'd like to um, say a big thank you to Danielle and the ANZ Guideline Network for the opportunity to share my experiences and to Alex and his team for the chance to develop an impact case study. 
Um, so I want to, um, to talk through um, a little bit at the beginning about um, lessons learned from our experience of doing an impact case study. I then want to talk um, quite a bit about the implementation activities we've undertaken and evaluated. And finally, at the end, I've got some advice for other guideline developers out there. So in terms of lessons learnt, um, when I was first invited to um, present our impact case study, I toggled between feeling excited about discussing a topic that I'm passionate about, which is research impact, and a case of imposter syndrome. Similarly, when we were invited in mid-2019 to develop an impact case study with the NHMRC, I experienced a sense of anxiety that we hadn't yet um, achieved outcomes or made much impact at that stage. So that was about six to seven months after our guideline had been published. Despite the anxiety, we jumped at the chance and Alex guided us through the process of um, creating the case study through preparing various versions of drafts um, that we provided feedback on and posing questions and prompts um, to help us um, to pull together the correct information for the content. Um, as I became familiar with the content, um, we realized, I realised that the outcomes and impact section was actually relatively small. Um, so through that, we were able to supply enough information. So we um, talked about the initial download rates that we had observed on the website. We made reference to professional groups that we were aware had, um, had been early adopters of the guideline or recommendations within the guideline the emerging role of the guideline within clinical pathways across Australia, our initial research studies that we had kickstarted, and a Department of Social Services project that had been launched. Um, preparing for this presentation today, including um, having a run through and looking at Alex's slides for the first part of this presentation, has left me with a sense that although our impact case study is imperfectly out there in the public sphere, it's available for readers to look at and become interested in our guideline and to direct them on to um, look more closely, both at the guideline document and um, associated resources, but also to be curious about our research studies and the DSS project that is underway. So in terms of implementation, um, before um, I talk about what we measured, um, I thought it would be helpful for you to have an understanding of what we planned um, when we published the guideline back in 2018. Um, as we go through um, the presentation, you'll see that I've used green text to indicate um, activities that we, uh, we have completed and orange text to indicate activities that are currently underway. So in terms of the, the ways that we made recommendations for implementation, there were two places. So in the main guideline document, we had a section at the end um, called practice points. And um, in that conclusion, we make suggestions from experts during the consultation period um, that cover future activities in four different areas within clinical research and policy settings. So we made numerous suggestions for clinical training, networks, accreditation and regulation programs, um, with initial steps being underway through the DSS project that I mentioned. So they have initiated an expert reference group with the key professional colleges and associations. Um, that um, initially commenced um, through garnering interest from those professional bodies at the beginning of last year. Um, but I expect that the reason that we've seen slower progress with that um, is that, um, that the shift of priorities um, turned towards COVID in 2020. We also outlined suggestions in relation to the dissemination, implementation, endorsement, evaluation, and ongoing update of the guidelines. Um, within that, we have partly achieved those um, through the dissemination plan and implementation toolkit resources that I'll talk to talk about in a moment, and also some of our um, PhD projects that we've commenced. We suggested in instrument development and validation, particularly in relation to the assessment of functioning. Um, and we've completed a national project that was funded by the NDIA, NDIA to look at a few of the commonly used assessment measures. 
Um, in addition, we have two Curtin PhD students who are in their final year at the moment where they've been developing and piloting clinician, individual and caregiver response versions of an assessment of functioning tool. And that's based on the World Health Organization's ICF framework. Finally, we suggested a public funding system for neurodevelopmental assessments. Um, so that's part, partly under a way, which I think is um, one of the areas of impact that I'm really excited about. Um, in terms of um, the diagnostic assessment, there is some Medicare funding available for that, but it's um, not yet um, consistent with the recommendations in the guideline, um, but the advocacy process has commenced with that. But we have had a lot of success in terms of the um, funding opportunities for assessment of functioning. Um, that's something that um, since we published the guideline, we've noticed that people who are already on an NDIS plan have been having reg funded regular reviews with their therapy teams. Um, we've also seen the introduction of the independent assessment framework um, that um, is looking to introduce um, a suite of assessment tools um, for new people coming into the scheme um, and eventually for people undergoing review. Um, and that's something I know some of you may be aware of it. Um, there's been quite a lot of media attention. Um, and I think from our perspective, um, it's really great to see the progress that has been made. Um, I know that there's um, been a lot of attention on the um, where it's not reaching best practice um, and where the plans are lacking, but certainly compared to um, the process that was in place before, it's a huge leap forward. The second place that we made recommendations for um, implementation was in our administrative and technical report. And we had a dissemination plan um, section of that report, and that was heavily guided by things like the agreed to checklist and also the NHMRC guideline resources that were available at the time. So at the time we made, um, we included with the publication of the guideline, a range of supporting documents and web resources. Um, that's just a small selection that we've got on the screen. So we had things like layperson summaries. We had evidence tables for each of the recommendations. We had templates for reports, referral forms, medical evaluations, um, and we also had a case study up there. We are keen to add to the case studies over time um, if possible. Um, and we've also got some journal articles that are currently under review. So um, they'll be out there shortly. And the plan is to also build on some evidence summaries for um, helping to guide um, topics such as assessment tools and um, summarising some of those, those research outputs. We also had a lot of promotional activities at the time of the publication. Um, so we were really fortunate to have an official launch in the Parliament House Senate Gardens. Um, and that was by Minister Paul Fletcher and Minister Greg Hunt. So the two ministers in charge of disability and health at the time. Um, and there was a lot of associated media interest with that. Um, following on from that, so we had a little bit of a, a lag time where we were seeking funding for some further implementation activities, um, but they that came through last year and we worked, um, the Autism CRC had a, a team working on that and we um, delivered and published uh, six um, clinician and two consumer fact sheets and corresponding explainer videos at the end of last year as part of an implementation toolkit funded by the DSS. Um, as part of that project, we also developed a baseline evaluation and audit tool. So that's an Excel spreadsheet that individual clinicians and teams can download um, when they're contemplating implementing the guideline. And it takes them through each of the recommendations. They can look at um, where they're sitting at the moment and set goals um, for implementing that. And they can go back and review that. So that's designed to be a really practical tool to help um, teams identify where the gaps are, where their strengths are and work towards implementation. We also um, recommended manuals and education programs. Um, so whilst new learning resources have not been developed by the Autism CRC team, 
the guideline has been um, integrated into the curriculum for the existing graduate certificate of autism diagnosis at the University of Western Australia, which is one of the autism CRC projects from a few years ago. Uh, the recommendations have been incorporated across all teaching. There is now a specific module dedicated to the guideline and students are encouraged to apply this knowledge to develop an imagined diagnostic service. Okay, so in terms of uh, measuring the impact, we have focused on three data collection methods so far to measure the impact of our implementation activities. So the first is website analytics, and we've been um, really fortunate um, to have that technology built in from the beginning. So the guideline was launched in October 2018, and since then it has been downloaded nearly 25,000 times, with about 50,000 downloads, including the supporting documents I mentioned earlier. The audience includes about 11,000 professionals from a wide variety of disciplines, about 4,000 caregivers and consumers, nearly 5,000 people from regional Australia and individuals from about 50 countries. The implementation toolkit resources, which were released in November 2020, have been accessed over 2,200 times. This included 1,500 new contacts to the Autism CRC database, which in turn has increased traffic to the guideline by about 50% and led to an additional 8,000 downloads of the guideline resources since this time. Um, individual fact sheets and videos um, have also been viewed between um, about 200 to 400 um, people each. And the baseline evaluation and audit tool has been downloaded almost a thousand times. So we're getting a lot of um, traffic generated and both of those autism CRC resources, um, I'm sure if we were to graph it, it um, wouldn't be a steady 22 a day, um, but we're, we're sitting in the above 20 a day downloads on average since their publication dates. Um, the NHMRC impact case study was published in October 2020 and has been viewed about 600 times with an average of about two minutes spent on the page. Um, feedback from Alex is that this impact case study has generated a monthly page view rate of twice that of the median um, for the other case studies. And it's now the second most um, viewed case study on the NHMRC website after the TB um, example that Alex demonstrated in his presentation. So the next way that we have um, measured impact has been through a PhD project by Anin, who is a clinical psychology PhD student at UWA. And um, through this project, we collected survey data from 373 clinicians in Australia, and that spanned all of the relevant disciplines and locations across the nation. Clinicians recorded their adherence on a zero to 100 scale for each aspect of every recommendation in the guideline. Um, and some of those recommendations had multi-steps, so we collated those into scores for each recommendation. Um, the other thing that they had the opportunity to do was to share the, their perceived barriers and facilitators to implementing the guideline through qualitative data. Um, and these findings are currently being written up as a journal article. The last area that we have measured impact has been through anecdotal feedback. So uh, the communications team at Autism CRC keeps a track of the um, media interest in the guideline and the toolkit implementation toolkit. So for example, the implementation toolkit resources have been featured in numerous media, news media articles and posted or shared widely through social media. Um, the metrics on that is that they've had a combined potential reach of 885,000 views um, based on the different um, reach of those different outlets. The guideline team also receives anecdotal feedback when we're chatting to people at conferences and events, um, in meetings, that type of thing. Um, and sometimes we're fortunate to um, be able to locate written evidence of their adoption of the guideline, um, as was the case following on from our conversations with people from ASPECT. So in terms of the futures, that's what we've been doing so far. In terms of the future, um, we've started a collaboration with Dr. Sue Lucas-Smith and Professor Louis Salvador Corolla from the Centre of Mental Health Research at the Australian National University. Um, the view is to use their global impact analytic framework that we've got a high level, I guess, screenshot of that on the page there to conduct an impact analysis of the early implementation stage of our autism guideline. 
This will involve using their toolkit to understand and rate implementation in relation to different components within the taxonomy that they've developed and underlying that. Um, and that's, um, we've had some really exciting conversations about the opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm sure, I believe Sue is on the webinar today. Um, so, um, you know, there's hopefully an opportunity if you're interested to find out more to do so. Okay, so leading into lessons learned. So I've got a few pieces of advice. Um, so they're based on things that we were pleased that we did and did well and things that we wish we had have um, done from the beginning. Um, so consistent with a shift in the research sector towards community participation, I would strongly encourage guideline developers to engage consumers in planning for the impact throughout all phases of the project. And if you're using a tool such as the Agree2, you'll already have some consumer participation in place. So that segues nicely to the next one. One of the things that uh, we found really helpful in developing our guideline and the implementation plans with that was to use the Agree2 and NHMRC um, guidelines for guidelines to plan for those um, those steps right from the beginning. So we very much use those checklists for the final product in our planning for our activities throughout. Um, ideally funding for implementation and impact evaluation would be secured at the time of negotiating funding to develop the guideline. Um, we weren't in the situation um, where we thought to do that. Um, but if that is possible, that would allow the guideline team to fully realise their vision around implementation. It would help to overcome some of the challenges of being, as the, the authors and the publishers, being the first point of contact if people have queries about implementation, if you've got that budgeted in to have a contact person for follow-up queries. Um, it would also help to um, reduce delays between the guideline publication and approval for the funding for the implementation project and then execution and completion of those projects. Um, an addi additional suggestion um, while you're busy securing funding would also be to look to get funding for having some sort of living guideline update. And I believe that that will be a topic of an upcoming ANZ um, guideline network seminar. Oops, gone too far. Um, the other points are around collaborating with universities through PhD research projects. Um, we found that that was really helpful, partly to, um, to allow us to get started with our implementation activities before we had secured funding for the DSS project. Um, it also meant that we were able to um, implement some of the recommendations that weren't necessarily a priority area for potential funders, so particularly around the development of the new tools, um, we were able to, to do that uh, without substantial funding support. Um, and it also meant that relevant theories such as implementation science, community participation, clinical utility were kept front of mind because of that um, academic perspective. Um, and the last recommendation is to connect with other guideline developers through networks such as um, the webinar series that we have today and um, the ANZ guideline network, attendance at um, training courses. So I know I met quite a few guideline developers at a grade workshop um, that NHMRC and Cochrane Australia put on and the Cochrane Australia conference um, that was alongside that. Um, I think it's really great to have access to those networks through the, the development, but also the implementation and evaluation side of things. So they're not only that um, you gain the informational support of sharing resources, but also the emotional support of traveling along the roller coaster um, that is guideline development and implementation. So I'd like to thank you for the time um, to come along to the webinar or to listen online to the webinar today. And um, I'll hand over to Danielle, who will facilitate the polling and question time. Hello, Kaya. Do you mind giving me back host functionality? Yes. Um, is that under more? It's under participants, so it should be more. Okay. No, I don't know. Um, Do you see the participants box in any section? I've got invite. No, yeah, just press, just 
the participants in general. Okay. Not, not the not the corner right. Oh, yes. Uh, Danielle, so if I go Danielle. Okay. More than make host again. Make host. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kai. I That's appreciate okay. that. So we're going to actually do one more poll um, to be able to, um, you know, see how we're going. Just bear with me as I get that. Pull up. Excellent. So I'm just going to launch some polling now after the presentation that Alex and Kaya have done. Do you feel confident in using data just to demonstrate impact? So maybe we'll get a few more yeses. We're not sure. I'm not trying to bias the results there. And do you feel you have a story worth telling? They're coming in very fast. Excellent. Okay, now I do want to encourage you to please put a question in the chat or put a question in the Q&A. Um, we would love to know your experiences. We'd love to know what you have done um, or if you need any clarification on the process of how to maybe put your guideline into with NHMRC um, and or any general questions about guidelines or even about our guideline uh, network that we have through GIN ANZ please put them in um, so we can talk about them. Uh, we've got some time. We've got about 17 minutes for Q&As, which is excellent. Often we don't. Um, so please uh, put as many questions as you can think and we'd love to be able to get to them. Okay, so people have stopped. I'm going to end the polling. We've got quite a few more. Uh, do you feel confident? The confidence level has gone up, which is excellent to hear. So thank you, Alex and Kaya. For that, we still have a bit of no's. Um, so if you are no or unsure, why are you unsure or no? Um, and, and put those questions in, uh, and maybe we can make you more confident um, or answer any questions that you have may you may have that are making you feel no or unsure in your confidence of um, using data to demonstrate um, impact. Do you feel you have a story worth telling? And 89% of you say you do. And I think that's absolutely fabulous. So I want to hear your story. I want to hear about your guideline. I want to hear why you think it's a story. So if you want, put in a pitch of your story and we will read some of them out um, to talk about your story and how it is a story worth telling and how we can um, NHMRC can help facilitate that. So thank you so much. I'm going to uh, invite uh, Stephanie Goodrick, uh, Dr. Alex Atkins and Kaya Evans to put on their screen again. Excellent. And we're going to start answering some questions. So the first question, which was answered by uh, Stephanie, and I appreciate that, but I would like some input, uh, input from Alex and Kaya on this one. So I would like to hear from, this is from Ginny, I'd like to hear more from the other panellists about appropriately recognising contributions from others, i.e. not taking all the credit. What is your experience in addressing this with integrity? Alex? I'm to leap in on that one. Go ahead, this, Alex. This, um, this comes up all the time with our case studies. Um, I think it's really important to remember that when you credit other people, you actually make your, your own case look stronger. If you're working with leading collaborators, um, if there's been funding coming from other sources, all of that goes to demonstrate that what you were doing was, was worthwhile. If you were the only person that cared about it, that doesn't seem as, as likely to be um, a really high impact project as if lots of other collaborators were working. So, so you never lose by giving, um, by giving a credit to to, to participate, I mean, to collaborators. Thank you. I love that. You never lose to giving to collaborators. Excellent. Kaya, do you have anything to add? Um, in terms of the, the guideline documentations ourselves, um, we had our, an acknowledgement section at the beginning of our guideline, and that was something that um, as we went through the the 12 month process that was the review of our draft guidelines through to our final guideline and the the various um, levels of public consultation expert review that sort of thing um, we had a working document of um, where we kept updating that so 
um, I hope that we, we managed to acknowledge the vast number of contributions that we had in terms of that guideline development. Um, and I think that that's a great, um, great question in terms of the actual implementation activities. So um, I, I'm not sure um, whether on our website text with our implementation toolkit, whether we've got the story of um, how and who contributed to developing those um, resources. I know that we've got Kelly online. So if we don't, I think that's a great suggestion um, to add a little bit of information to our website text. I know that we certainly had a lot of, um, we had consumers, we had um, clinicians, we had our, our core team working together um, to put those together. So I think that, yeah, if we haven't done it, I think it's a great idea to do it. Stephanie, you, you put up a detailed response, but do you just mind providing an overview for everyone else in the chat? Well, my, my clumsy little response in there. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with collaboration. I think one thing I wanted to add was about transparency of the process. I think people always want to know who is involved. And um, if you can make that really clear and accessible for people, then that does sort of help um, yeah, I, I think that sort of brings an integrity to the process and, and helps a lot of people um, trust the information, really. And we've had uh, two questions about website analytics or measuring impact and how do you know if these numbers are significant compared to other guidelines? And Emily then followed that up with how difficult was it to get the details about the don downloads and that reach of media? I think people are now thinking about their investigator grants potentially and the impact and that is a way to prove impact. So can you talk to us about how you got that information? Um, so in terms of, I don't know how it compares to other guidelines um, and I don't know where to find, I guess um, I know that some of the impact case studies um, you know, they're building up around guidelines, but um, the, they cover a broad range of NHMRC outputs. So I'm not sure exactly where to find that information. I guess for us, if it, we had to put a comma when we were writing the number, that felt pretty cool. Um, so that, that was sort of when I was preparing the, the slides. Um, if I, and I think that when we looked at the social media reach, um, where that had all been added together, I had to put two commas. So that was almost two commas. So that was um, pretty exciting to be on the verge of a, a second comma in that number. Um, in terms of the ease of doing it, um, from my perspective, it's quite easy. I, I email Kelly and she extracts it from um, the website. Um, from the website perspective, I think that it's, um, it's more complicated, but certainly doable. So we, um, with our website, the guideline is set up where people register for it. So they complete a small um, survey that we put together so that we had some metrics of people. And then they're, once they've registered for it, then they, um, they can go on to, to download it. Um, hopefully, I know Kelly is online, um, so Kelly might be able to type an extra um, response. She's writing, yeah. So Kelly says it's easy to get um, basic numbers, but you need a good system in place to ensure you can get more detailed information, such as whether they are professional or not. Um, so that's with the survey. Um, so yeah, so I don't know, it, it might be possible um, to add with the, um, if there's any good links of uh, so, you know, the server that we use or, or the, some of the technical side of things, we might be able to provide some of that information afterwards. Um, but definitely well worth doing. And um, I know that between the original guideline and um, the new website that launched with the implementation resources, we've switched to a new dashboard. So we're still getting a handle on that, but that should extract um, some, um, some more detailed information. And it's really, you know, some of the, the graphics that the dashboard manages to spit out are pretty cool. I had um, the heat maps for Australia and the world, which is quite exciting to see, but there's also various other visual um, ways that it presents the information. So I think it's, it's about thinking about how you host the guideline um, before publication is really important. And certainly you want to have that, if you're a, obviously if you've got a guideline, you can only measure from the time you put it in place. But if you're developing a guideline, planning from that and getting those systems set up in advance of the publication, because your download numbers obviously will be 
um, probably hopefully the highest around that original launch when you've got a lot of buzz of it. Um, so Kelly has also put some notes in there. Um, so that is also how we're able to map them on those maps. Uh, we use Drupal, uh, D-R-U-P-A-L dash SF connection. This is a, a financial time investment in getting it set up. Um, and SF stands for Salesforce. Um, and Kelly is happy to chat with people's comms teams if they would like more information. And I think my final slide, I've got hand out, handouts there. Um, Kelly, can you please put the uh, email that people can contact you by to be able to talk about those systems to be able to get those analytics set up? Thank you so much. There we are. Kelly's done that for everyone. So um, if you have any questions, Kelly, about that, Kelly looks like she'll be able to, to help you there or your comps team set those um, set those up for you. Thank you so much, Kai, for answering that. Alex, do you have anything to add there? Um, well, I guess I'd just say that, um, that there would be a degree of danger in comparing numbers between one guideline and another for, I think, probably some pretty obvious reasons in that, um, that uh, the, the potential audiences for something like auti autism, for example, which you know there, there's a great many people who might be interested across the country in autism guidelines, even you know, they could just be uh, Joe and Jane public, um, whereas that wouldn't necessarily be true for all guidelines if they were clinical practice guidelines or public health guidelines. You know, there are topics like fluoride or you know vaccines at the moment. Anything anything topical will get a lot of hits just because it's topical, and that's certainly what we find with our case studies is that. Um, the history of tuberculosis control case study is our most popular, but that's really just because of web searches. People are interested in TB, maybe maybe because, um, uh, well, I mean, just it's, it's been a global problem for a long time. Um, so, so it's not that that story is better than any of the other stories we've told necessarily. It just happens to be a more popular topic. So I think um, going back to my presentation, I'd say boldly go ahead and tell your, your story in such a way that um, because of your confidence in telling it, your reader will feel confident that it is important. Why? Because you've told it. You wouldn't have told me the story if you didn't think it was a story worth telling. I guess that's the attitude I think would be best to have. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, direct this next question at Stephanie. Uh, can the presenters recommend any further resources or literature that I can engage with after this session about guidelines and impact? So, Stephanie, I know you, you can direct them to good guidelines and Alex about you can direct them to the impact maybe. Um, well, stay tuned for that. I mean, we're planning on um, releasing a public consultation draft of a module on impact and evaluation where uh, one, I'm, I'm, we've been sort of scoping that at the moment and I wanted to a lot of this feedback from the seminar and some consultations that we've been doing with um, guideline developers over the last few months. So I'm, I'm hoping to bring all this information together, including sort of some um, references and resources and put it out for public consultation within the next few months. And I would be grateful for all of your feedback on it when it does go out um, when we do publish it. And thanks. We will, we will definitely put that in our, our ANZ, DIN, our, our ANZ guideline network our newsletter um, when that comes up and we'll be working with Stephanie to uh, ensure that you all have the opportunity to, to consult on that. So thank you. Alex, do you have any other resources? Um, I'd like to make a plug for CSIRO's Impact Evaluation Guide. It, it is structured around um, developing cost benefit analyses and return on investment calculations, but there's some very good theory in there. And I think that it, it, um, it, it gives, it provides you with an, a number of lenses to look at impact storytelling, which I think I, I use it quite a lot. So I think it's a good bit of um, work. And, and Kaya, what resources did you use? So um, what resources did we use? In terms of planning for the, for having impact, definitely the agree to form. So we um, had self audited our guideline at various stages um, to see where our gaps were and, and made sure that we filled those. Um, as I said, we used it right at the very beginning to plan some of those activities. Um, and then we had external people um, use the agree to form um, and we responded to those things. Um, we also use, so prior to the guideline um, to guideline resources, we use the previous iteration of 
resources on the NHMRC website. We also used um, some of the World Health Organization resources on developing guidelines um, and the sort of implementation activities. In terms of evaluating, um, we probably, we, you know, we didn't have a lot of systematic resources we went to for that. I know that from our PhD student perspective, um, she had a conceptual framework. So the, it's the TDF. I don't know what it, I can't remember off the top of my head what that stands for. Um, so that was a particular framework that was put together that she utilised for doing the, um, the survey. Um, and um, I think the rest of it was just, um, I don't know whether there was a particular resources that Kelly and the team used in terms of um, the, the website or if that is a, a common practice or, uh, yeah, I'm not sure um, what resources were, were used from that perspective. Thank you. Is there a place for Australian guidelines when there are guidelines from other countries already published? Um, or should we look at implementation of other guidelines in Australia? Alex and Stephanie, I think that's a question for you both. Sorry, is there a place for... Uh, so Jessica has asked, is, is there a place for Australian guidelines when there are guidelines from other countries already published? Or should the focus be implementation of other guidelines from other countries, but in Australia? Uh, I mean, is, is this with respect to development of guidelines? Um, is this, are you looking to adopt and adapt other guidelines for use in Australia? Is that what the question was about? Um, I, I'm not sure, but if you were adopting and adapting, is that common practice? I, I think most people try to adopt or adapt guidelines before they go to develop them um, themselves. But, um, and, and we have a module on the guidelines for guidelines that talks at length about um, some of the advantages and a few of the challenges in doing that. I think I saw Philippa Middleton on the line too, who was the editor of that module. But I'm I'm happy, um, Jessica, if you want to email me directly, I'm happy to um, start up a conversation about that with you. Excellent. Do you mind putting your email in the chat? Sure. Excellent. Alex, do you have anything to add to that? No, it's, it's outside of my area. That's all right. <laughs> So thank you, Jessica. Um, I think that's maybe some more contacts and um, your conversation with Stephanie will be able to answer that. The last question I will bring up is how much funding do you plan for impact evaluation? Is that how long a piece of string is or is there a more substantial answer than that? Kaya, I'll, I'll bring it to you. Um, look, I think it's how much is a piece of string. Um, I think from our perspective, we put in requests for various different things and some things got approved and some things got not, knocked back. And that's where we linked in with um, PhD students so that we could still get some of the activities happening. Um, and, yeah, um, I think that I know that certainly with our implementation resources, some of the things that we needed to factor into that were... Um, we needed a project manager um, with a communications background to pull it together. We needed to have um, funding to, um, to pay for the video production and um, the, the actual design elements of the case study. We needed to have funding for um, expert um, consultation and input. Um, and then obviously there was um, in-kind um, that came from the various organisations involved with that. So in terms of those, uh, the direct um, implementation toolkits, um, the other projects, um, I think part of it is scanning the environment to see who might be um, interested in different components of the implementation. It's, it's, um, it's possible that you might need to go out to various different funding sources um, for that. But I think um, as with as I've learned over the years, um, trying to, to be as realistic and, and really think through and project what the range of costs might be um, and not jumping into it too quickly to anticipate that there will be challenges and delays and, and that sort of thing. So trying to 
have a realistic estimation of what the costs will be before you start negotiating is probably my best suggestion. Thank you so much, Kaya, Alex and Stephanie for the q and Hopefully it's clarified a lot of people's concerns um, and thank you for also directing them to some very, very good resources and offering your time to help um, the ANZ Guideline Network community. We really do appreciate it. I'm going to just quickly make a plug for our next webinar, which will be on June 11th. Um, the Living Guidelines Approach, is it achievable and sustainable? It will be with Kelvin Hill from the Stroke Foundation and Heath White from Cochrane Australia. This is about keeping advice current. It is often criticism of clinical guidelines. The Living Guidelines Approach aims to therefore respond rapidly to important new evidence and ensure the recommendations are kept up to date. Now, aspects of this emerging approach will be described based on projects done in stroke and diabetes management, and the important learnings will be shared along with ongoing challenges and potential future opportunities. We know that last year living guidelines um, were highlighted quite a bit and there have been many challenges, but they've also been uh, showed the strength of them. So it's going to be a very interesting webinar and we hope you'll be able to lock it in and attend um, and we'll see you there. Uh, just also before we leave, we just want to thank you formally for joining. There will be a short evaluation that will pop up on your screen after you leave the webinar. We do ask that you fill that in as we are trying to improve our community um, and our ANZ, ANZ um, Gen community to be able to ensure that it is helpful. So please fill in that evaluation um, so we can ensure that and also I want to point out uh, the NHMRC Guideline for Guidelines Handbook. Um, basically the first stop to any guideline development um, or if you're thinking or planning or if you need to have any answer uh, questions, that would be the first book to go to. It's a valuable, invaluable resource. A lot of time and effort has gone into that. So please look at that, um, at that handbook. And that uh, is the formal end of this webinar. And I want to thank Stephanie, Alex and Kaya once again for your work um, in this area. And um, we're looking forward to the feedback of the webinar. Thank you so much. Um, and we will end the webinar here. Thank you. Bye.